Hello and welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. I'm your host, Raj Daniels, and today I'd like to welcome Jessica Marshall to the show. Jessica Marshall is the co-president and CEO of the Green Mission, Inc. Jessica ensures proper research of IRS codifications and relevant case law, as well as conferencing with other personal property appraisers and industry leaders to ensure the mission of waste diversion shared by nonprofits, government entities, deconstruction contractors, and individual and corporate donors can be realized with utmost attention to detail from a tax standpoint. Jessica, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How about you, Raj? I'm doing fantastic. Jessica, where in the world are you? I am in a town about 52 miles south of Washington, D.C., called Fredericksburg, Virginia. And how's the weather out there? The weather's beautiful, um, especially having moved here from Wisconsin five years ago. This is heaven. We have cherry blossoms in full bloom in our front yard and beautiful temperatures. Sounds lovely. So, Jessica, I'd like to open the show off by asking my guest the following question. If you were asked to share something interesting about yourself, what would it be? The most interesting thing about myself is my family. I have five children, um, one of whom is adopted from foster care. And most of what, if not all of what I do in my career as both a tax professional as, as well as waste diversion is with hopes of benefiting my children as well as future generations. You know, it sounds like you and I are very similar in that vein. I have three. I wanted five. My wife said no more. But um, so much of what I do aligns with, you know, how I want to see the world for my children. Absolutely. And that's exactly what brought me into the waste diversion industry. Um, I've run my own tax practice for 18 years, and that was wonderful. And I was able to do a lot of good for others with that practice, especially taking a lot of pro bono clients who needed the earned income credit and volunteering in board positions. But when this opportunity to affect construction and demolition waste diversion was presented, and I saw that I could quite literally in three or four months time divert over 100 trucks of material that was destined for a landfill and have those materials end up in government entities like public schools, in nonprofits, in homeless shelters, I had such proof that what I have entered into is for the common good that I'm more fired up than ever to continue down this path. Well, you know, since you brought up waste diversion, can you share a little bit more about your company, the name, and exactly what you guys do? Yes. So the Green Mission Incorporated was started in September, and I opened this company to affect waste diversion, in particular construction and demolition waste. So as a CPA, I'm very well versed on the tax mandates and IRS codifications for non-monetary charitable contributions. Now that provision of the tax code, which ends up being a tax deduction for individuals, pass-through entities and corporations, is a value that is placed on materials and property that they choose to donate rather than demolish. So a typical deconstruction for a residential home would involve a deconstruction contractor going into the home and the process of unbuilding. So instead of just demolishing, smashing everything down to pieces and carting it off to the landfill, paying the tipping fees, instead, the structure is carefully dismantled and the materials that can be salvaged and reused are put to the best use through reuse. And then the materials that do not have any further use, we look at recycling streams. And through these projects, we could go into a residential structure that was set for potentially 100% de demolition to go to 90% reuse and possibly 5 to 10% recycling with very little of that structure ending up in the landfill. So when you extrapolate a residential structure and you look at a commercial structure that is set for demolition and you see the tons and tons of materials that could potentially be reused, they still have plenty of useful life. They're of high enough grade that they can be incorporated into new and existing structures the tons of material that we can salvage from large commercial jobs 
is is amazingly huge. And as with those corporate jobs as well, another important part of our waste diversion is that it's not just deconstruction. So we had a project that we completed in Pittsburgh and it was five or six floors of beautiful corporate furnishings with a law firm. And we typically get called in at the very end, which is how these things tend to happen. We have a wrecking ball planning on coming on Monday, for example, what can you do to divert? Is there anything we can do to divert this waste? So we scrambled and we worked with a wonderful nonprofit uh, named Construction Junction in Pittsburgh. We worked with the Pennsylvania Resources Council and we were able to divert almost all of those furnishings to the various public schools that were in the area. And it ended up going to 11 public schools. And then what we were not able to place, there were some metal filing cabinets that we could not get anyone to take. Rather than dumping them, we did get them recycled. So 85% of the contents of that corporate office were reused by public schools and 15% were recycled. And if you look downstream to what this looks like, uh, it's not just the landfill that we're saving. That was wonderful. But there are beautiful tiger wood desks and expensive chairs and furnishings that were now in use in public schools. That enables a budget for a public school to be used for educators, for hiring more paraeducators. So this whole cycle of waste diversion, we can look at the landfill tonnages that we're reducing, and we can also look at the good social benefits of programs like what we're doing. So it sounds like you're really addressing that triple bottom line, if you will, the planet, profit, and people. Absolutely. And the triple bottom line was what was missing prior to me entering this industry. I had my tax practice and I was able to affect a lot of good, but I needed to do something at a larger scale. And this was critical to me as I looked at my oldest going off to college and she had discussions with me where she said, look at the climate, the climate science. Do you believe this? Do you think this is true? And I said, yes, this is absolutely true. And she said, well, what are we doing? All I see is that we're recycling some cans. We buy things, our furnishings from antique stores and secondhand markets, but what else are we doing? And she was almost in a panic mode to wonder as adults in her life and as professionals, what are we doing? So when I dove into this industry and I've been able to sit with my kids and their friends when they come over and I talk about what I'm trying to do to elongate this potential crisis that is looking to implode in the next decade or two. And I'm looking to push that time back and if possible, working in concert with other individuals like you and other professionals in the reuse and the environmental industries, we can affect a lot of good as private professionals that along with government implementation of policies Working in concert, we can get a heck of a lot done. And that's what I'm doing. So a couple of questions come to mind. First, do you know if, now I don't, I'm not asking you to name competitors, but do you know if you're the only business in this space here? Because you're the first time I've heard about it. So there, it has been quite a niche market. We, there are amazing deconstruction firms nationwide. And we work nationwide with many of them who are doing a, fabulous job. What has been missing in this space is the tax and financial component. The appraisals that are done for these deductions must absolutely follow IRS codifications, the appraisal organization standards, and you have to have a high level of knowledge of the tax law and the underlying accounting concepts. Unfortunately, there have been some industry members that have uh, in summary judgments that have been decided both this January and last January, entire deductions were disallowed because the appraisals were not done correctly, as well as some other aggravating factors to those cases. But what those cases have highlighted is that 
to affect environmental change, which promotes waste diversion of this type, the tax deduction is a critical carrot. We must have this deduction to get individuals and corporations to make the choice to deconstruct and donate. So as such, I drafted with some colleagues, including Mayor Donkara, who is my COO, and he has a master's in construction management from Texas A&M, as well as Edward Dunn. Um, he's the executive director of Building Resources in San Francisco, a reuse facility. We drafted 66 pages of very straightforward literature as a guide to how these appraisals must be valued. The long and short of it is that all valuations need to be attached to an accurate sales comparison data point. What happened in those two cases and what has been alleged to have happened throughout the industry is that appraisers have used new cost estimating software, such as RS Means or Marshall and Swift, and they have entered in some values for new materials arbitrarily assign some depreciation and come up with valuations that are then taken by a taxpayer, either on their Schedule A, they're an individual or a pass-through, or on their 1120 as a corporate charitable deduction, and they're inflated valuations. These materials, when properly valued, are much more like what you would think of giving clothes to goodwill. That shirt that you bought for $75, when you donate it to Goodwill, it probably only has the value of about maybe $7 to $15. Deconstructed materials in many respects are the same. There are certain materials, appliances, property that do not depreciate that quickly and that do have very high sales comparison value. But regardless of the value being low or being high, it must be accurate. And right now, we are the only appraisal firm nationwide who's being run by a CPA who's taken the time to dig into these requirements to attempt to save this deduction. If the deduction is uh, completely slashed for deconstructed materials, we are then left to promote deconstruction without having this valuable tool. Now, this tool, if we get into the finances of it, deconstruction costs slightly or more or a lot more than demolition. And if you think about the process, it's going to cost more to have someone come in and potentially unconstruct and take apart carefully for salvage rather than the proverbial wrecking ball. So the fees are higher for deconstruction. The other critical component that pushes back against deconstruction is the timeline. When you have an individual or a corporation who wants to quickly get rid of a structure and rebuild something, they need it done quickly. And deconstruction is going to take more time. So when we can get to these clients at the initial stage, we take a full inventory of what the structure has for salvage. We provide an initial quoted value range that's based entirely on comparable sales data. They then can talk to their CPA, their controller, their CFO, and see if the tax deduction works in their situation. So if there is potentially $100,000 of salvageable materials and they're at the 20% effective tax rate, they're looking at a dollar for dollar, $20,000 payback. If deconstruction costs $10,000 extra over demolition, they're going to come out $10,000 ahead. That $10,000 ahead has been proven in our in what we see in behavior to be an adequate carrot to have them choose the deconstruction over demolition. What that tax deduction is not, it is not a cash windfall. Somebody who is deconstructing a 1,500 square foot house up in Northern Virginia and they receive a quoted value range that these deconstructed materials are worth $350,000. That sounds fantastic. And for many of these taxpayers, they have no idea that that value is not tied down to any comparable data. They go ahead and take the tax deduction. If or when they come up for audit, those values cannot be substantiated. They lose the deduction. They have underpayment penalties, and it becomes 
a cautionary tale to others who are looking to deconstruct. So my goal is, number one, the waste diversion. I'm going to continue to look at best practices for the sustainable building all the way through to a deconstruction. But in the, my equal goal is to ensure that these tax deductions are valued correctly and to ensure that only appraisers who have adequate college education, who have experience, who understand the underlying accounting principles are in practice. Um, I'm also a community college uh, adjunct professor and I recently spoke with the head of the workforce development uh, team, which is the, the college that I work under, and they are interested in starting some personal property appraisal courses where we could potentially train individuals to come into this market and train them correctly. Right now, there are probably approximately 17 to 20 deconstruction and reuse appraisers nationwide. And from those 17 to 20, there are just a few that are doing the majority of all of these appraisals. Those individuals need to report back to clients substantiating their education, substantiating their experience, and they must follow these guidelines that have already been put out by appraisal organizations in the IRS. If we do this correctly, we can use this carrot for many, many years to come as a financial incentive, and this will move the needle to deconstruction over demolition. However, if we do not do that, we will lose this tax deduction and we are going to see huge tonnages that are going to the landfill simply because there is not a financial incentive to do the environmentally responsible thing. So questions, the document you mentioned, do you have it available on your website? We absolutely do, yes. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. You mentioned um, deconstruction takes a little more time. About how much time? Obviously, I'm not going to nail you down to a particular number, but just ballpark. Sure. Ballpark would be for a residential structure, if demolition could be done in a week, then deconstruction could potentially take three or four weeks on average. Of course, larger structures, you're going to see more of a time lag. But with that being said, many of the deconstruction uh teams that we work with around the country are doing what they can to shorten that timeline and to establish best practices for what to salvage first, what needs to go right to recycling. That's another critical component of this is that some materials are not fit for, uh, for reuse and they should go right to recycling. So it doesn't make sense to, to take up all of the carpeting, is, for example, very carefully and roll it up. Carpeting typically is never reusable. Carpet tiling squares are reusable, but it makes more sense to look at the best way to recycle carpeting rather than trying to salvage it. And the last piece you talked about from a jobs opportunity, it seems like there's a tremendous opportunity for community colleges and even some you know, bachelor's programs to address some of these issues going forward. Yes, and the American Society of Appraisers has looked at implementing some of these undergraduate degrees. I would like to see this come in undergraduate degrees under the accounting, engineering, construction management, architecture. Those disciplines correspond very well with the work that we do. So I'm working very diligently to increase this pool of potential appraisers. We have plans. We are now operating nationwide, and we will be expanding and opening satellite locations where I will be looking to hire very competent, well-educated appraisers who follow the correct methodology. Unfortunately, there's a dearth of those professionals right now in the industry. And the last thought I had while you were talking is that, you know, recently there was this building here in Dallas that it was a failed implosion, essentially. And I've always wondered about these buildings before they implode or before they do, you know, deconstruction to your point, how much of the furniture, fixtures and equipment they, you know, take out of these buildings. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, I can. I can speak to that from my experience. It's very little. That takes more time. And what we found in Pittsburgh, however, was very heartening as to what we can do on projects like that. That material inside those buildings of corporate structures, most likely the furnishings have been fully depreciated. 
when assets are fully depreciated, there is no basis in taking a deduction. So the tax deduction is not possible. When we did the project in Pittsburgh, we were able to come in on our quote for removal of all of the furnishings at 52% of the cost of demolition. The difference there is that we found it actually costs more money to have to break all the furnishings into pieces that fit in the dumpster, get all of those pieces to the dump, and then pay the tipping fees. Removing the furnishings as they are in one piece and delivering them to organizations who need them. And with us managing those logistics, we were able to present to that client a contract, like I said, at 52% of what they would have paid for a traditional breaking, disassembling and getting rid of it. The other critical piece there on the Pittsburgh project was that they had an absolute timeline that we could not hold up. So we chose to work, we worked with the building coordinators and we were able to work overnight and on the weekends when there was very little traffic and there was no competition for the freight elevator. And with that, we were able to meet their demolition timeline and get everything out, like I said, to the 11 school districts, even down to about 30 plants that our COO, Mayor Donkara, found in a room and they were languishing and dying. So Mayor went and watered all the plants, called Stacy Alvin at the Pennsylvania Resources Council, who then called the Phipps Botanical Garden, who adopted all of the plants. So we saved absolutely everything from going into the waste stream. And when we talk about absolutely everything, we received notification from one of our our subcontractors that a broken chair had been thrown into the dumpster. It was a single chair and we called the recycling company back. They drove out, removed the chair and were able to recycle the metal on the chair. So when we say 0% into the waste stream, we truly kept that at zero. That's fantastic. And as a plant lover, I appreciate you saving the plants. I, I appreciated it too. Poor Mayor said that he was just so sad to see them all dying in that room. And it, it was wonderful. And we have links to that case study that we did on the, the project in, in Pittsburgh. And I really, if I could get one message across to corporate owners of these floors of, of materials, there was a project that Mayor and I worked on in Baltimore. And there were 10 foot high cubicle walls we could not find anyone who would take these. So our support staff spent one week and we called hundreds and hundreds of locations. We found a school that said, we will take every single 10 foot cubicle that you have. And we were very excited. Then we followed up and we said, we, we just need to ask out of curiosity, why are you taking these? These are so difficult to place, no one wants these. This is a school that serviced blind children. And they needed to create a training maze for these students where if they hit a wall, they would be protected. So they took these 10 foot cubicle walls and were able to have a training facility for the students learning to walk with a guide stick. And then they were able to take the desk from the cubicles and all of the teachers were able to have desks. So if corporations can realize Beautiful stories like this exist for these materials. There are people who want them. And companies like ours can do this in a feasible, cost-effective way, with or without a tax deduction, and we can do so much good for so many organizations. That really is a beautiful story. And switching gears a little bit, you touched on it earlier regarding your daughter. So what's your why? What's driving you to, you know, be so engaged, involved, immersed in this? So what has been driving me from the time that I finished my, my graduate school, which at the time was in the, in the olden days before we had computers and seeing how difficult that, before we had email and were able to do things online. So what drove me then as a woman business owner was that we needed to have a, a more hospitable work environment for women. I experienced a lot of a lot of barriers there because I chose to have children. So I opened my own business. 
And then we adopted a son from foster care. And what that has taught me, he has severe special needs. And he, with his low, lower IQ and his mental health issues, he's not able to work traditional uh, employment opportunities. But he's in a training center right now that works on workforce development. And because of programs like the one in which he is involved, they are able to teach him how to do things like being a plumber's assistant. This child can build anything out of Legos. We saw this from a young age, but it didn't translate into the traditional classroom. And seeing what he's able to do in workforce training programs, and then looking one layer deeper into these workforce training programs, how are they funded? How do they get the materials they need to teach these children? They get these through donations. These corporate donations, when they are ripping out plumbing systems, if there's a hotel remodel, these materials that could potentially go to organizations like the one where my son is learning must be kept out of the landfill. And this is a circle of, of doing good and seeing good and feeling good. These are the programs that support my son. And these are the kinds of programs that can help move more parents to adopt out of foster care when they see that these amazing special needs children, there are career paths, but these career paths are run by nonprofits. They are run by donations and everybody trying to help each other. So when this opportunity for waste diversion, where I have uh, of my five children, the oldest in college, who's t terrified about the environment. Child number three is in a training center for workforce skills. And my youngest is a, a wonderful little girl with a, a severe, um, what is considered terminal heart condition, who asked me these questions, what are we doing to make things better? I now have an answer. And I'm hoping that as I keep pushing forward in this waste diversion mission, that this will be expand. There'll be new avenues I haven't explored yet, new areas for growth and for reuse and repurposing. And the best part about all of this is the feeling when we complete these projects and we see the good that's being done. This is how this is how we're going to do great things as a society and as a nation and as a world. Jessica, I love your wine. Such a touching story. You know, I come across people like you so often that are driven, optimists, have taken action. And every time I do, my admiration level gets higher and higher. I told someone recently that I'm so fortunate that as part of my work, I get to speak to people like you on a regular basis, you know, especially at time right now, it's such an uplifting feeling. So I really appreciate you sharing that. You're welcome. And I'm so grateful that you are highlighting stories like this. And I'm grateful that there's so many of us, especially in this terrifying of a time, like I said, my youngest daughter has um, a, a, a terminal heart condition. So we are in a shelter in place, but good can still be done. And, and you bringing these stories to light and helping connect us as people and professionals who all want what's good. I just appreciate it so much. Thank you so much. So Jessica, I'd like to end the show with the question of, if you could share some advice or words of wisdom with the audience, what would it be? The words of wisdom and advice as a business owner are, the bottom line is important when you're reviewing that profit and loss, but what's more important is how we're treating others and what we're accomplishing as a society and for the common good. Finances will always, always figure themselves out as long as we're doing what's good, what's right, what's ethical and honest, everything will work out. Well, Jessica, I really appreciate that. Is there anything else you'd like to share? No, thank you so much for hosting this. I've really, really appreciated this time. Thank you, Jessica, and I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Absolutely, Raj. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for listening. And if you like what you heard, please give us a rating and review at Apple Podcast. Bigger Than Us is a Nexus PMG production. And if you want to show your support and help us grow, please share with a friend or reach out to us on social media where you'll find us under our Nexus PMG handle.